So please open your Bibles with me now to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Today we are entering into the second main section of this book of Hebrews. Chapters 1 to 2 over the last few months have been primarily about Jesus' superiority over angelic beings and his work on our behalf as the trailblazer, as the forerunner of a new and better humanity through his suffering and death. Now, now the writer enters into the second main section of this book, which will extend from chapter 3, verse 1, all the way to the end of chapter 4. And this next section is, is primarily about a warning, a, a warning to hold fast, to grip tightly to the hope that we have in Jesus. And this second section, we will see, has three main sections to it. Verses 1 to 6 of chapter 3, which we will study today, have to do with the reason for the hope that we have. Verses 7 to 19 of chapter 3 have to do with a warning to hold fast to the hope that we have. And then chapter 4 will give us comfort in our hope. And so these two chapters are both essential for the logical flow of the book and for our encouragement and increased confidence in God and in our salvation in Him. And so let's begin now by reading verses 1 to 6 of Hebrews chapter 3. The writer says... Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Amen. May God bless the preaching of his word yet again here this morning. Friends, if I was to tell you about a basketball player who has six championship rings, six playoff MVPs, five regular season MVPs, a basketball player who was the lead scorer 10 seasons of his career, who averaged 30.1 points per game throughout his career, who had eight 50-point playoff games and more than 40-point game, more 40-point games than he had less than 20-point games. Who would I be talking about? Michael Jordan, absolutely. Arguably the greatest NBA player of all times. But then, if I was to talk to you about someone else who has played for 21 seasons, who has the all-time scoring record, who has four championship rings, who has gotten four MVPs, and who has been an all-star 20 times, who would I be talking about? LeBron James, also arguably the greatest NBA player of all time. And the debate is endless. And we all love a good argument or debate about who is the greatest of all time, don't we? Is Caitlin Clark the greatest of all time women's bas basketball player? In, in soccer, is, is Ronaldo the, the GOAT or is Messi the GOAT? There are GOAT arguments that go on even within our church. Which is the greatest of all time pizza establishment in the state of Delaware? I know the answer to that. You can ask me afterwards. <laughs> Last night I was at a restaurant and my waitress almost didn't serve me because I mentioned that I like Coca-Cola better than Pepsi. She was horrified. I don't understand. Pepsi is dirty water and nothing more. <laughs> These debates are common. 
And in many ways, the writer of Hebrews is leading us now into one of these debates. Although, listen, it's, it's not much of a debate. It's more like a rock-solid and irrefutable argument that he is making for us. Jesus is the greatest of all time. The, the, the writer is earnest here. He's earnest to tell us that, that no one and nothing in this life or in this world compares to Jesus. And he's earnest. He's, he's earnest that we would be happier and, and stronger if we accept this reality and rejoice in it and continue to believe it. The, the, the writer does not want us to lose confidence about Jesus. The, listen, the, the case is too strong for Jesus. There is no data. There are no stats that can compare. There are no greater achievements that might be accomplished by anyone else that will anyway displace Jesus from his place of superiority and glory. No one compares to him. And in order to further convince us of this and to ground us in the goodness of this reality, the writer now begins this next section by comparing Jesus to Moses. And, and it makes sense that he would do this this morning because so much of the book of Hebrews, as we will learn, is about the superiority of Jesus over the Old Testament covenant. And so it makes sense that the writer would begin by comparing Jesus to Moses, who is the man used by God to give the Old Covenant to the people of Israel. Listen, Moses was a big deal. Moses was the goat. He was the greatest of all the prophets. The Jewish Christians being written to here had great confidence in God because they had Moses on their side. But the writer wants their confidence in God and in his salvation for them to increase even more. And, and in order for that to happen, he wants them to now consider that Jesus is even superior to Moses. He, he knows that this comparison is not going to lessen the significance of Moses, but it will heighten the significance and the glory of Jesus, and it will increase our, our confidence in all that he has done. The main idea for our, our sermon this morning is this, considering Jesus leads to greater, and confid greater confidence in God. Considering Jesus leads to greater confidence in God. In God, we got three points this morning. Number one, the faithful servant. Number two, the faithful son. And number three, the faith filled house. Let's begin with the faithful servant. Verse one says that we are supposed to consider Jesus together, we're supposed to keep our eyes fixed on Him. Why? Well, because it says it that he was faithful to him who appointed him. And, and we know this already, don't we, right? In, in chapter 2, we saw that Jesus was made perfect through his suffering. Now, he was made perfect not in the sense that he was imperfect before his suffering, but rather in the sense that he passed every test that was put in front of him. He was made perfect because of his perfect obedience, even through the test of death on the cross. And so the writer says, he was faithful. We are to consider Jesus because he was faithful. But how faithful? How faithful is this Jesus? Well, the writer wants us to know that he was faithful, verse 2, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. And again, this is a big deal because Moses was a big deal. When it came to these Jewish Christians, Moses was the goat of the Old Covenant. He was at the very center of God's Old Testament revelation. Listen, even as we just finished studying the book of Exodus for an entire year together as a church family, we learned that Moses was indeed faithful. He was certainly not a perfect man, but he was used mightily by God for God's people. Moses was an intercessor between God and Israel. He was a, a mediator. He, he spoke to God face to face on their behalf. And the writer of Hebrews knows how worthy of honor Moses is, and he knows it not just because the people thought of him that way. He knows of it because of how God speaks of Moses. Because when he speaks of Moses here as being faithful over God's house, 
the writer of Hebrews is actually quoting the very words of God. In the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, chapter 12, when Moses' brother Aaron and his sister Moriah complain against Moses, God calls them to the tent of meeting. Aaron and Miriam, I'm sorry, were were being critical. They were being grumpy about their brother Moses and his leadership. They didn't like his style of leadership. And it says, it says, And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward, and he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. So so God is saying to both Aaron and Miriam, Miriam, listen, for ordinary prophets, for the everyday sort of prophets, I speak to them through a dream or a vision. That's how I normally work with my prophets. But then he says this. He says, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. That's what the writer of Hebrews is quoting. God says, with Moses, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. God says to Aaron and Miriam, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The the writer of Hebrews is quoting God's very words about Moses, and he's not even trying to, he's not trying to put Moses down in this moment. No, in this moment, he actually says, look at how faithful Moses was. You should revere Moses. You should honor him for his faithfulness. You are right to respect this man. The writer of Hebrews honors Moses, but he does so in order to tell the the Hebrew listeners how much more they should honor Jesus. He's trying to show that that though Moses was very faithful, Jesus' faithfulness is much more significant. Moses and and, and Jesus, they're they're faithful, but, but Jesus is even more faithful. Moses as a servant, Jesus as a son. So think about this. Think about how amazing Moses really was. This is the man who was providentially put in Pharaoh's house as a baby. This is the man who encountered God in the burning bush. It is the man who spoke for God to his people, who brought about the ten plagues and spoke courageously against Pharaoh, the superpower king in, at that time. This is the man who led Israel through the Red Sea on dry land. This is the man who climbed Mount Sinai and spoke to God face to face, who gave Israel the law of God and then interceded for Israel when they sinfully broke that law. He's the goat. You simply don't get better than Moses, except for Jesus. He was faithful even as Moses was faithful, but Jesus was faithful even more so than Moses. But again, it's not that the writer throws Moses under the bus. It's it's not that the writer is saying that in comparison to Jesus, Moses and everything else in this world is worthless and, and trash. Just forget it all. No. He's helping us to prioritize what we consider most valuable in our life. We we can and we should revere Moses. God, God wants us to do that, but we should not do it in a way that lessens or diminishes the way that we consider and value Christ. Moses was temporary. Jesus is eternal. Friends, even with this quote being from Numbers chapter 12, The writer seems to be warning us today, listen, if Aaron and Miriam were so corrected by God for not paying close attention and respecting and considering Moses rightly, Moses who God says in Numbers 12 and here in Hebrews chapter 12 was merely a servant, if they were corrected for not rightly listening to and considering him, how much more should we pay attention to Jesus? That's the logical flow of these first six verses of chapter 3. And so, Christian, what in your life is not necessarily bad? You don't need to throw it under the bus entirely, but, but what in your life do you value more than Jesus? What might you revere a little too highly? What do you find your comfort in rather than Jesus? 
what you find your hope in rather than Jesus. The, these Jewish Christians were very tempted to, to trust in Moses and the Old Testament law more than Christ himself. Christian, what are you tempted to trust today more than Christ? Is it yourself? Many of us lean on our own understanding. Is it, is it your therapist? Is it your family? Is it your career? Is it your physical well-being? Is it, is it your understanding of science? What do you think of as amazing and trustworthy? Listen, it probably is amazing and decently trustworthy, just as Moses was. But the writer of Hebrews wants us to remember that whatever it is, it is not as amazing or as trustworthy as Jesus. Consider him. Consider Jesus who was faithful in a similar way to Moses, but who because of who he is and what he's done was even much more trustworthy than Moses. Friends, that brings us to our second point. Point number two, the faithful son. Listen, in the Joel Shorey household, I am the greatest basketball player of all time. I am the GOAT. There's no arguing it. In the Joel Shorey family, there has never been a better basketball player than me. And listen, the stats speak for themselves. The stats don't lie. I have more points. I have more steals. I have more blocks in my kids' faces. I have more over-the-minivan trick shots. I have, I have more horse victories. And I have made more children cry because of my overly competitive spirit. <laughs> but I am the GOAT. I am. But if LeBron or Jordan come to my house, then all of that changes immediately. I, I might be the goat in my narrow little field, but as soon as you expand that field even a little bit, everything changes, doesn't it? Friends, that's the point that the writer is trying to make about Jesus and Moses. Both are faithful, but one should earn our trust a lot more than the other. This is the point of these six verses. And now he tries to illustrate it. He tries to convince us of it through two significant illustrations. Look first at how he says that Jesus is the creator rather than the created. Look at verses 3 to 4. It says... For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. It's a very easy illustration to follow, isn't it? The, the writer says that the difference between Moses and Jesus is like the difference between a house and the carpenter who built the house. If you look for a new home, you can appreciate how beautiful it is. Maybe it has a lot of square footage. Maybe it has a very open layout. Maybe it has all the spaces that you need for your family. Maybe it has high ceilings and big bright windows and a great floor plan. And if it's all of that, maybe it costs a million dollars today. But that's not the point. If you look at a beautiful house, who should get the glory? Should the house get the glory? No, the designer and the builder of the house should get the glory. The architect's the one that designed all of those spaces, and the, the carpenter is the one who made it all happen. They should get the glory. We, we don't praise the house itself. No, we appreciate and we give glory to the one who built it. Or if someone like my wife Ashley is a skilled house decorator, you don't come in and say, Shory House, you're amazing. No, you say, Ashley, you have a beautiful home. You give credit to where credit is due. But the writer is saying that, that it is the same with Moses and Jesus. Moses, listen, Moses in a sense was a piece of furniture in the house. He's an impressive piece of furniture for sure. He's a foundational part of the house. But we shouldn't look at Moses and give him the glory. No, we should look at Jesus who poured the foundation and built the walls, who constructed the roof, and who furnishes every room of that house. This is the difference. This is the difference between Moses and Jesus. And in case you don't get the illustration, the writer makes it explicitly clear when he says, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Jesus is not just building little sheds 
No, he is in the business of building the entire universe and the house of his salvation. Moses, Moses is a piece of furniture in this extraordinary work, this extraordinary house that God is building in and through his son, Jesus. So friends, let me ask you this question. Do you see Jesus in this way? As being over the whole house. Not being a part of the house, but over the whole house. Or do you view Jesus as if he's just another piece of furniture in the house? And so if your house, if your life is a house, you probably have a desk in that house that can represent your work. And then you probably have a table that can represent your family members and you probably have a garage which holds all of your hobbies and then you probably have a couch which is your leisure and your rest you probably have a pantry which we can say represents your bank account you have a basement which is full of ballet and basketball and soccer for the kids and then oh yeah upstairs in the corner oh there's that chair which is Jesus I mean maybe it's your favorite chair Maybe you try to spend time in it for about 10 or 15 minutes every morning or for about an hour and a half every Sunday morning. It's a good chair, but when it comes down to it, Jesus is just one of many pieces of furniture in the house. Christian, the writer is saying that we should consider Jesus in a way that is entirely different from that. Jesus is not a piece of furniture in the house. He's not even the house itself. He is the builder of all things. He is the builder of the entire universe. He is the builder of your very life. This is who Jesus is. And this is the glory that he deserves. Now the writer gives another illustration. He also says that the, the contrast between Moses and Jesus is the same as the difference between a servant and a son in the house. Look at verse 5. It says, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. I think that picture has many different parts to it. A servant, a servant isn't really a part of the family. He's, he's hired by the family. But, but the son is the heir apparent. He, he has honor and authority and, and position. A, a servant has to do what he's told in the house. It's an obligation for him. He has to do what he's told. Actually, notice in verse 5 how it says that Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. So Moses, as the goat of the Old Testament, his entire existence in the Old Testament was as a servant who was just pointing forward to someone else who was to come. The focus isn't even on him at all. A servant does what he's told, but a son gets to live in the house. A servant has to serve the son because of the son's authority and power and position, but the son does not have to serve the servant. The contrast is significant, isn't it? Jesus is better than Moses. Moses is amazing. He's, he's a really impressive piece of furniture, and he's a really faithful servant, but he is not Jesus. Do you see? Do you see what the writer is trying to say? He's saying, pay attention to Jesus because he alone has the power. This Jesus alone has the knowledge. This Jesus alone has the skill. This Jesus alone has the sufficiency to give you what you need. Stop paying attention to lesser things. Pay attention to Jesus. And listen, as these verses come immediately after chapter 2, we should be very eager to pay very close attention to Jesus because this one who is the builder of all things, this one who is the son, the heir, the one with all authority, this is the one who chapter 2 says tasted death for everyone. This is the one who was made perfect through his suffering. This is the son who, who did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Listen, taking the form of a servant, being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And listen, he did it for us. Hebrews chapter 2 says that he became our brother. 
He entered into the household that he had created, that he's making in order to be with us and to die for us. And so, this is the greatest news that the world has to offer. We who are faithless, and oh, are we faithless. Even this morning, we have been faithless. We who are faithless are called to consider, to focus on, and to cling to this Jesus who was faithful. He was the Son who entered into the house that he had made, became a servant of that house, and died for all the people in the house. He is the one who has made us holy, verse 1, forgiving us of our many sins, sanctifying us for his good purposes. He is the one who has made us brothers, also verse 1. He is the one who has added us to the house of faith, and he is the one who has given us a heavenly calling. He is the high priest of our confession it says that word confession in verse one oh it speaks of a creed it speaks of a statement of faith it speaks of a banner over our lives it speaks of what we as christian men and women confess to be true and that is that jesus lived for us that he died for us that he was raised from the dead for us. This is our confession and this is our only hope. Friends, consider Jesus. Consider who he is and what he's done for you. He's, he's the faithful son. And don't just consider him, but hold fast to him. Cling to him. Grip tightly to him. Never let him go. And that is indeed the final call of this text, which will lead into our next sermon next week. We see it in verse 6, and it brings us to our, our third point. Point number three is the faith-filled house. You know, as I was preparing, I, I had a bit of a silly picture that came to my mind, and it is, it is of a gymnasium with a lot of people in it, and they're all there for a basketball camp. They're wanting to learn the game of basketball. And on one side of the court is LeBron and Jordan giving lessons on how to be a better basketball player together. They're doing it together. What a lesson that would be. And on the other side of the court is a seven-year-old child who's also giving lessons on how to play basketball. And as I saw this picture, I saw many people in the room, and so many of them, I would say most of them, were sitting on the floor paying attention to the child giving his lessons with their backs to LeBron and Jordan. And I saw the coach standing in the center of the court, and I'll make the coach the writer to the Hebrews because he is looking at all those people, and he's saying, you're looking the wrong way. Turn around. Friends, we must turn around and consider Jesus because he's better, even better than what we, that contrast I just made. To be a faith-filled house together means that we look in the right direction every day of our lives. And that is what verse 6 demands of us. So after speaking of the house which Jesus has built and is building, listen, the writer beautifully says, and we are his what words those are. Redeemer family, we are his house. But it continues, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. The, the writer is saying that the way that we prove that we are his household is if we hold fast our confession and our boasting in our hope. He says, this is what faith-filled family members do. They boast in the one who is making the house. They boast in Jesus. Listen, we are his house. That's a fact. And it's a beautiful house. The work has been accomplished. Our confession is clear. We have a great high priest of our confession. Christ has built a glorious salvation for us to live our lives within. But the way that we daily prove that we are of his house is if we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Those words, if indeed we hold our confidence and our boasting in our hope, commentators agree that those are very public and visible 
terms. You don't, you don't boast in something privately, right? You boast publicly. You want others to know. To consider Jesus is, is not a personal or private thing in the Christian life. It is that to some degree, but it is much, much more than that. To consider Jesus is to make your life and your entire family's life a visible demonstration of your confidence and your hope in him. Friends, this is how we rest in the security that he has given by continually boasting in him as our security. Here's the reality. Friend, every day that you live, every decision that you make, you are, in a sense, engaging in a goat debate. Every day, in every decision of your day, Every part of your life, your, your life is making a, a visible argument for who and what are the greatest of all time in your world. The writer is saying that as the household of faith, as, as those built in Jesus, we should make this debate very clear. Boasting is not private. Boasting is public. Everyone that looks at us should see very clearly that our boast, that our, our confidence is not in ourselves, not in our career, not in our boss, not in our money, not in our hobbies, not in our good works, not in our Bible knowledge or our Christianity. Our hope is in Jesus. When people look at us, oh, they should see that our boast is in him. Our lives should be the final say of the debate. Who's the greatest? He's the greatest. Look at my life. It demonstrates it. How we make this argument matters. And he's going to get into all the details of it. We, can, we make this argument for all those looking at us by considering Jesus together. That's why we're here. That's why we value Sunday mornings. I mean, when you come here and don't go elsewhere on a Sunday morning or you get out of your bed on a Sunday, you, you're making the argument, he's the greatest. My comfort's not the greatest. Jesus, King Jesus, Lord, Master of my life, he is the greatest. That's what happens when you come to church. It's a profound statement of value and worth. When you fellowship with each other, and somebody asks you a question and says, how are you? And you don't just give them the perfunctory answer, but you say, you know what? I need to confess sin to you that I've been struggling with. Do you know what that is? That's winning the debate on who's the greatest. Because you're not saying that your, your, your image or your... Your reputation is the greatest. You're saying Christ is the greatest. And you're secure in him. Now when you, when you labor in ministry and you serve faithfully on that ministry team, even when there are people on that team that you don't necessarily drive with very well, when you patiently work beside them and love them and care for them and build with them, you're making an argument. You're saying, I don't have to be around people who are just like me. This household is filled with people different from me. And I love them. And I love them and I, I'll sacrifice for them because... He's the greatest. When you give generously, every month when you look at your bank account and say, man, I could really use that money in a different direction than giving to the church. But when you say, no, I'm going to do it because this is what he calls me to and because he's the treasure of greatest value, you're winning the argument. You're winning the argument. People are seeing, look at how these people live. They, they treasure something far better than themselves and it's making them happier than all the treasures that I'm clinging to. You're winning the argument. Friend, which side of the court are you sitting on? Which direction are you giving your attention to? And what does it say about your faith in Jesus? Does the direction of your life demonstrate that he is your confidence and your hope? Or are you looking in the other direction, demonstrating that while you love Jesus some, there are many, many other things that you consider as valuable or even of greater value than him. Let's turn back to Jesus. In every area of our lives, let's boldly, confidently win this argument that he truly is the greatest. What, what a savior we have. And how patient he is with us when we fail in this very thing. But it's that very patience that should make us boast all the louder that he is the greatest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being greater than all other people and all other things that our hearts are tempted to trust in. Lord, we love you. We delight in you. Lord, even as we sang earlier, would you take us deeper into the truths of Calvary? Would you make our hearts uh, overflow with wonder at how great and marvelous you are? Spirit of God, do this among us in increasing ways, we pray. Amen.